Well, good morning, Grace Dover. Uh, it really, it really is a privilege to be here with you again, especially on today for this occasion for the installation of Pastors Joshua and Kenny, my brothers and uh, and friends, to worship with you with multiple languages, reminding me of uh, of our church home. I bring you greetings from uh, Washington D.C. Grace Mosaic. Uh, where my family and I worship, which is pursuing the same vision in Northeast D.C. that you are pursuing right here in Dover, Delaware. May God be glorified. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you. <laughs> I want to speak to you this morning from the passage that you've just heard read on this subject, the spirit of solidarity, the spirit of solidarity. And here's the point of what I want to say to you this morning is this, that the Holy Spirit gives God's people a new identity and creates a solidarity within the church that calls us to sacrificially enter into one another's needs and sufferings. The Spirit of Christ gives God's people a new identity. And creates a solidarity in the church that compels us to sacrificially enter into each other's needs and sufferings. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you again for this morning, this service, this word, Lord, your word that is living, active, and sharp. And we pray that through the preaching of your words, you would continue to grow us up into Christ, that you would give us what we need to hear this morning, that we would, would become more faithful servants of Jesus Christ, glorifying him in this place and beyond all over the world. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Eleven years ago, uh, a somewhat historic uh, event uh, took place in Jackson, Mississippi at Mount Helm Baptist Church. Uh, Mount Helm is the oldest black uh, church in Jackson, Mississippi. It was uh, planted in 1835 when several enslaved black worshipers who, who had been worshiping in the basement of First Baptist Church of Jackson started the church. The conference from 11 years ago was a conference on race and the church in the 21st century. I wasn't there, I didn't attend in person, but I, I viewed the sessions online and hard truths, hard truths were discussed on how the church in the United States, particularly the majority white church in this country, had failed by putting ethnicity over unity. We did talk in this country about the separation of church and, and state, but in the matter of race and color, there's a history of actually great agreement between the church and the state, and it's not a good one. I was born in 1968, a year before that, more than 16 states in this country still prohibited interracial marriage. There's certainly no outcry from the majority white church on that matter. Indeed, in 1959, a Virginia trial judge stated in a case his legal rationale justifying the constitutionality of the prohibition against interracial marriage. He said, Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents, and but for the interference with his arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. Now, hearing things like that from a generation ago makes us uncomfortable. It turns our, our, our stomach a bit, and it says, well, why do we even want to bring stuff like that up? Well, because it's part of our history. It's part of the, the reality of, of the ways in which God's people did not pursue this, this unity in diversity and love across lines of, 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 of difference. 
I lead uh, with, into this message with that story because there is a sort of a, a going in that needs to take place. The terrible history of race and the church in the United States is real, but I want us to, uh, to go into this text uh, 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 with something that's also real. Here's what I mean. The church was never, ever problem-free. Uh, uh, the church was never problem-free, but what we have in these verses in Acts 11 is like a treasured picture in your family album. Just like what I said from the 1950s and earlier as part of the history of, of, of the church, so is what we see here. And I want us to grab hold of that history as a part of our family story. I want us to go in and take ownership of this heritage as God's people, as what we ourselves are determined to pursue. So God transforms this church, giving it a new identity. And then we see God creating a need for, for these two Christian communities. One that, that is predominantly Jewish church of Jerusalem and Judea and the predominantly Gentile church of Antioch. He creates this need for these two communities to recognize their need for one another. And to exhibit a Holy Spirit-generated solidarity uh, in Jesus Christ. So I want to try to get through four things with you this, this morning in this message of Spirit of Solidarity. I want to talk about four things. A new people, a new joy, a new name, and a new solidarity. A new people, a new joy, a new name, and a new solidarity. Luke, the author and writer of Acts, has started to focus on the way that Jesus is working out his plan for his church by, by breaking it out of its Jewish-only cultural identity. A shock and drama takes place in chapters 10 and 11 of, of Acts when Peter goes to Caesarea to the Roman centurion Cornelius' house and his family and his friends, Cornelius' family and friends are converted and become disciples of Jesus. And Peter, when he returns to Jerusalem, was criticized for having fellowship and eating with Gentiles. God is starting to add some new people, some, some different people to the church and, and people who were so different that it disturbed the believers who were in Jerusalem. Now in verse 19 of our passage, Luke takes us all the way back to the beginning of chapter 8 in Acts when the persecuted, persecution started in Jerusalem. He's not following a strict chronological order. He's following his theme about how Jesus added these new people to the church. And he says in verses 19 and 20, those who were scattered because of the persecution uh, that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. After Stephen uh, was stoned to death and Saul, who would be named Paul, starts raging against the church, trying to destroy it, primarily the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians left Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Luke told us back then that those who were scattered went about preaching the good news, preaching the word. And he picks this theme back up in verse 19 and says they didn't just stop at Judea and Samaria, but they, there were some who continued northward up the coastline to Phoenicia and the island of Cyprus, even as far north as Antioch. They went about telling people about Jesus, but the problem was they were only sharing the good news with their fellow Jewish people. They were stuck in their understanding of what kind of people they ought to talk to about Jesus. But then Luke says there were some of them who got it. There were some who got it. He, the, there were some men who were natives of Cyprus and Cyrene who decided to break out of their cultural container and tell the good news about the Lord Jesus to non-Jews. 
God is bringing some new people, some unexpected people into the church. And verse 21 makes a powerful statement. Luke says that the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. In Caesarea in chapters 10 and early in chapter 11, we were dealing with primarily one Gentile, Cornelius, and the amount of people who could fill his house when Peter came. Now we're talking about numbers of converts, like what happened in Jerusalem after Pentecost. Luke says a great number turned to the Lord, and it's the fact that the hand of the Lord was with them is the powerful statement. The hand of the Lord, the presence and power and authority of the Lord was with these men from Cyprus and Cyrene who took Jesus to the Gentiles. The hand of the Lord is always with those who reach beyond their place of comfort into the thorny places for his purposes. Particularly understanding his desire to transform many with his good news and to use them to do it. See, this doesn't mean that when we take that on, we, we won't experience the thorns and the thistles and the discomfort and the, and the challenge of going across lines of difference. It means, however, we will never be alone. We will always go with the full power and authority and presence of the Spirit of Christ. Point out a couple of things here. First, look, these are ordinary everyday people. These are not the apostles Luke is talking about here. They didn't need a personal visit from the Lord like what happened to Peter to tell them to go to the Gentiles. We're here to install pastors Josh and, and Kenny, right? But this is not a description of what only the pastors do. This is describing the actions of people who simply had an understanding of the gospel. They knew the good news and had been transformed by it themselves. They understood that this transformation was not just for them and people like them. They wanted to see as many people as possible receive this new identity and become a part of this new people. Secondly, secondly, we see these large numbers of people become believers in Acts, and we can think that all of these conversions took place, uh, 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 mass conversions took place in one shot. But this is not a mass conversion. Luke simply says uh, a number... A great number believed. The scattering uh, that Luke talks about in verse 19 is at least 10 years prior to Barnabas going to Antioch and then going to get Saul in verses 22 and 25. Toward the end of chapter 9, when Saul is sent to Caesarea and goes off to Tarsus, he's there about 10 years before Barnabas goes looking for him to bring him to Antioch. And here's the point. What we have here described is not some easy evangelism. You know, say something about Jesus once and everybody believes and all the people come running. What we have here is the long process of being in a a people in a place, getting to know the place, getting to know the people, getting uncomfortable, sharing Jesus along the way and watching him work to bring people to himself. There was a time, Grace Dover, when you weren't a diverse church. There was a time when this congregation didn't look uh, this way. When, when Pastor Seda began to move this congregation with a different vision, how long did it take to go from that to what you see now? It wasn't a day, it wasn't two days, it wasn't a year, it wasn't two years either. Listen, how many years, how long does it take for change to come? How long does it take? How many years of preaching and teaching and fellowship and love? The Spirit regularly works over the course of years. 
And so even we're here today installing pastors Josh and Joshua and, and Pastor Kenny, and we look and we see this great diversity. And my point is, listen, you're not finished. <laughs> you, there is more that the Spirit wants to do. There is more of the nations that the Spirit wants to see reflected right here. Now, today is not a, it's a day of celebration, but it's not a day of resting on our laurels to say we've arrived. Amen? That wasn't in my notes, so that doesn't count against my sermon time. A new joy. As new people are added, we see the Lord bring a new joy. Luke says in verse 22, the report of these new people being added and turned to the, turning to the Lord, it came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas, uh, the son of encouragement. And what a perfect choice they, they made. Barnabas was a Greek-speaking Jewish Christian from Cyprus, and so he might have been the natural choice. But the better reason to choose him is described in verse 24. He's a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And that's demonstrated in his response to seeing all of these new believers. Barnabas has a new joy. He's glad because he recognizes the grace of God. When he got to Antioch and saw what was going on, what he saw in verse 23 tells us was the grace of God. Barnabas sees these new believers from the unclean Gentiles, this new international community, and he does not need convincing. It brings him joy and gladness because he recognizes the grace of God when he sees it. So he jumps in fully with both feed and brings uh, and begins exhorting them in the faith. He exhorts them to, pur to purpose in their hearts to be devoted to the Lord. He's urging these new believers to cling to Jesus with determination and purpose. What is God doing? God is giving the church precisely what it needs. Barnabas is a bridge builder. Uh, he's someone who doesn't recoil at the thought of, of what the church is going to be or look like when you have all of these people who are so different from one another coming together. He doesn't recoil at, at having to ha have his own biases challenged because of this cultural diversity. He could recognize the grace of God when he saw it. He was sent there probably as a concern out about all of these Gentiles being added to the church, but Barnabas was not uh, going to turn concern into control that hindered the grace of God. That's the kind of leaders God places in his church that pursue unity and diversity, that don't recoil at what the church is going to be when you put all of these mix of differences together. We're looking to see the grace of God at work. See, it's easy to be a complainer, <laughs> but it's much harder to be an encourager. What, what's go, what goes on with us, right? Do we let complaint and disappointment about our expectations, about what we think the church should be and look like, uh, 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 drive our thoughts and our heart that, that comes when things are not the way we want them to be, uh, uh, to, to push us to the, to the sidelines or even out of the door? Or does God d discipline our hearts and give us new joy when we see his grace exhibited it, even though it's not maybe what we expected. Work starts to get a little bit, much, a little bit much for Barnabas, and so he decides it's time to re-engage Brother Saul. He goes to Tarsus, which is not that far from Antioch, and goes to look for Saul, and when he finds him, he lets him know, listen, we got to go back to Antioch. God is putting his grace on display in that place, and there's work for us to do. And so Barnabas and Saul return to Antioch, and I can imagine Saul sharing in Barnabas' joy for a whole year. Luke says the, the two of them met with the church, and they taught a lot of people. This is the picture of them regularly gathering the, the church together to teach them what it means to follow Jesus. These new believers wouldn't have been familiar with all of that uh, the Old Testament had said about God's promises uh, and about his, to send a Savior. In fact, 
notice that the primary reference to Jesus in this text is Lord, not Christ or Messiah. See, what, what Gentiles in Rome would have been familiar with is the title Lord or Kurios. You you start talking about Messiah and they would have looked at you funny. So they met them with the language and the description of Jesus that the people could grasp. Jesus is Lord. Oh, I know what that means. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul taught them the significance of what it meant to know and believe that Jesus is Lord. And this beautiful picture of this beautiful painting of of international evangelism and discipleship leads to the new people being called by a new name. In Antioch, Luke says, the disciples were first called Christians. A new identity for these new people. It's no accident that we don't find the word Christian ascribed to the followers of Jesus until after the church has had this massive influx of Gentiles and becomes a mixed group. Jesus has has bought and is creating something new. So it wasn't sufficient for this group to be considered just an offshoot or a sect of Judaism. What Jesus did and what Jesus continues to do had implications for the whole world and for all peoples. And notice, they didn't give themselves the name. They didn't say, hey, what are we going to call ourselves? (laughs) Oh, how about Christian? No, no, no. They, They weren't even thinking that way. Luke says they were first called Christians in Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. It was the people of Antioch this fourth largest city in in Rome with a population of about 500,000 people. The people of Antioch were famous for their nicknaming skill, and the believers stood out as a group. They obviously, they weren't Jews. If they were Jews, you wouldn't have this large intermingling of Jews and Gentiles together. So they decided, let's call them Christians. Their identity now as a people was connected to this guy, the Christ. So when the Gentiles began to turn to the Lord, not only did they receive a new identity, but the church received a new identity. Jesus chose Jerusalem to be the birthplace, the launch pad for Christianity, but he chose Antioch to be the nurturing place where the gospel begins to go deep down into the impenetrable places. The church that we model is not Jerusalem. The church we model is Antioch. It's where we begin to see the day that Isaiah spoke about in Scripture uh, in Isaiah chapter 19, verses 24 to 25, where the Lord says through Isaiah, there's a day coming when Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, who the Lord of hosts have said, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. When Antioch is established and God gives his people a new name, we see the beginning of that day when the whole world will worship the one true God. Do you understand what I'm saying, Grace Dover? This is our story. This is our story. This is the picture in our family album that we got to keep going back to and looking at. We are a continuation of what the Spirit is determined to do all over the world. Last point. After this new name is given and we we, we see it put to the test immediately as the Holy Spirit demonstrates a new solidarity. Luke says in verses 27 and 28, in those days, 
prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius. Luke is always careful to tell us, give us some historical reference. At some point in that year of Barnabas and Saul's teaching and discipling, some prophets traveled the 310 miles from Jerusalem to Antioch with a message, there's a great famine coming, and it's going to be all over the whole world. Now, all the world meant all the Roman world or the Roman Empire from our vantage point. And so at a time of what we might call great spiritual prosperity in Antioch, Agabus proclaims a message about great physical scarcity and suffering. He says this period of great scarcity and lack that they predicted is the famine that took place, Luke says, during the reign of Claudius. Claudius was emperor during A.D. 41 to 54, and his reign was marked by a long a series of crop failures in various parts of the empire. And the question is kind of hanging out there now. In response to this prediction of disaster, what's the church in Antioch going to do? I mean, we see what they did. It's right here in the text, but that wasn't the obvious answer. Let me ask a question. What, what happens here in, in Dover, Delaware, when the weather... Uh, the weatherman says that there's a great snowstorm coming. You know, one of those 24-inch deals is coming uh, in the next couple of days. What do we do? We, we run as fast as we can to the store, get up all the batteries, all the water, all the bread, all of, like, we, the shelves be empty at just the word that the storm is coming. We pile it up in our homes because we want to make sure we don't suffer any lack of anything that we need when the storm hits. Well, what makes us think that the prediction of impending famine wouldn't have produced that same sort of look out for yourself mentality and the threat of suffering and loss produces in us? What makes us think that their first inclination wouldn't have been to begin hoarding food and materials and resources for themselves to ride out the famine? But that's not what they did. They responded to the prediction of great scarcity and lack with an expression of solidarity that only the Spirit of God could create. So, Luke says, the disciples determined each one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers and sisters who were in Judea. And they did so, Luke said, sending it by the hands of the, uh, the sending uh, it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. What's going to happen when the Gentiles in the Antioch church find out that the Jews in the Judean church are in need? Are, are old divisions going to rear their head? Is this, new, is this new identity for real? Is this new identity going to react in a different way of living and acting? Because they understood the gospel, the message that Paul and Barnabas had been de devoted to teaching them, their response was an immediate expression of love and care through sacrificial giving, each one of them determined according to their ability to send relief, whether they had much or they had little, they wanted to participate in this relief. And who were they sending it to? Their brothers and sisters who, uh, who lived in Judea. We don't, don't miss this. They are saying we are one people. We are now one people. There is a solidarity between us. We are no longer divided, but we are one in Jesus Christ. They understood that because they had been brought with a price, the blood of Jesus, they now belonged to God. They were not their own. And what that meant was that everything they had also belonged to God. Therefore, their attitude was we must do with what we have what, out of obedience to Jesus Christ. These believers in Antioch gave from what each of them had out of obedience to Christ. It is a beautiful picture of spontaneous love-driven 
obedience. Let me wrap it this way. Here's the picture Luke has been painting of how the message of the gospel, the message of God's love for us in Jesus Christ creates in us a solidarity across dividing lines and a love-driven obedience to God's commands. We, you saw it with Peter. We see it with the disciples who went to the Gentiles. We see it with Barnabas and Saul. We see it with the disciples in Antioch. Here's the deal. Apart from Jesus, everything I do with everything I have is out of obedience to me. It's Jesus who calls me to take every thought captive to obedience to him. This includes sacrificially entering into the needs and sufferings of others. It's not enough to talk about how grateful we are for our salvation in Jesus Christ. It's not enough to talk about the love of God and get good Bible teaching. The church in Antioch could not have had better teaching than Barnabas and Saul. There was going to have to become a point where they would have to put what they heard and had said they believed into action. Raised over, you have had and continue to have great gospel preaching and teaching. Amen? Amen. But it's not enough. God's people always have to put that good teaching into action in a sacrificial and costly way. They couldn't be content to use their resources for their own efforts. Everyone who follows Jesus gets that privilege. And you have to love the expression of solidarity. The apostles in Jerusalem had sent Barnabas to Antioch to check out what was going on with all of these Gentiles turning to the Lord. And now the the believers in Antioch send Barnabas and Saul back to Judea carrying the funds they collected. They weren't hoarding their money. They weren't even hoarding their teachers. We're going to demonstrate our love and solidarity by sending you the best of what we have, both financially and ministerially. Imagine how the humbled the churches in Judea were to receive such needed assistance from their Gentile brothers and sisters in the Lord. Imagine how humbled but grateful to receive assistance that they didn't ask for but that was freely and sacrificially given when the need was identified. Imagine how encouraged and empowered the church in Antioch was to know that the Lord had used them to further break down dividing walls of hostility. This is grace. And this is what grace does. It humbles people without degrading them, and it exalts people without inflating them. This history of grace and solidarity in Acts 11, it belongs to the church's family album. Just as much as the ugly stuff does. So let's determine by the grace of God to go on in the side of sacrificial solidarity, taking every thought captive in loving obedience to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that the spirit of solidarity is still active and at work in the life of your people. Continue to grow us up into Christ in our unity, in in him, and our love for one another across every line of difference to your praise and glory. Amen.